Hello boys and girls, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stian and today we have a pretty cool watch on the bench. It's a 1972 Longin Conquest Monopusher Chronograph, made especially for the 1972 uh, Munich Olympics. It's a very cool watch, I think. Very nice style. See especially the second hand, the chronograph hand is a little bit worn and some marks on the case, but uh, overall uh, very good condition. And we saw that it runs. Doesn't run too great, but it also doesn't look bad for a watch that uh, hasn't been serviced for probably decades. Use our sticky bolt to open the case. And voila! Longin 334. Or wait, is it? It looks suspiciously like the Valju 236. Oh well, it's not uncommon for uh, manufacturers to do this. Basically the only change Longin did was to take away the small seconds. So it's uh, Valju 236 movement at its base, which is of course still a very good movement. Get all the hands off and a dial and we store that securely and then we can start looking at how the chronograph works. So this is a monopusher chronograph and what that means is that one button makes everything possible. And just to clear up any confusion, it doesn't actually make everything you would like to happen possible. Sorry about that. But uh, everything a chronograph does, that one pusher does. So the same button will start the chronograph, it will uh, stop it and will reset. And it will always do exactly that. So there's no possibility to, uh, let's say, pause it and then uh, restart it. It's always the same uh, sequence, one, two, three, start, stop, reset. That also means that everything is controlled by the pillar wheel. There's no opportunity to have any separate action because everything needs to go through the pillar wheel. So that also has a consequence for how we're going to take apart the chronograph mechanism. Given that everything is a little bit more intertwined than in uh, most uh, chronographs. As you might uh, guess, the monopusher was the uh, original chronograph, if you will. It was uh, Breitling that made the first uh, two-pusher chronograph uh, just before the Second World War. Be sure to check out the Breitling Navitimer video, by the way. A beautiful watch and a very interesting movement as well. For chronographs, it's a good habit to put the screws back in place after taking the part off. But it's not a good habit to let the screws lie loose on the plate while doing so. Ping ping! Ah, the elusive double ping. Anyway. We found the parts back, they don't go very far, but uh, still not a good habit. When taking uh, this uh, chronograph bridge off, important to be careful with the pivots. It's uh, not too difficult to break them. And we're almost down to the base movement. I'm going to talk uh, a lot more detail about the different parts and uh, what to look out for when we put everything together. For now, we we'll basically just unscrew everything and try to keep a little bit uh, track of what goes where. As with all mechanical watches, uh, there's perfect logic in what the parts do and uh, how they do it. So once you understand that, it's uh, not too complicated putting a chronograph uh, together again. But finding a manual or a videos on how to do it is always useful. We're putting in this little metal plate so that we have a base to press against for this uh, Presto tool to take the chronograph driving wheel off. That is a pivot that is also quite easy to bend or break. We're checking the end shake and side shake. So basically how much slack there is in uh, the bearings for the wheels. Should be a little bit, but not a lot. And when we take the three-quarter plate off, we see the train of wheels. It's always a nice thing to see, I think. Just very fascinating. What 
is this? A self-lubricating barrel? Hmm. Have to see how uh, well uh, that uh, does self-lubricate. One thing that can happen is that uh, the Inca block spring comes loose, as did here. So we're going to have to put that one back afterwards. Don't bother with that now, we're going to clean the movement anyway. It can be quite tricky to get in place, so I will look at that. Now, for those of you uh, who have watched a few of my videos, know uh, that uh, Longin is a brand I have a lot of respect for. If you haven't done so, uh, check out uh, some other uh, Longin videos on my channel. But what I'm getting at is that uh, maybe it's a little bit of a surprise that uh, this is not an in-house Longin movement, given how many fantastic in-house movements they made. They also made some uh, fantastic uh, chronograph movements, but most of those were in the earlier days. So I don't think uh, Longin made uh, any uh, in-house chronograph movements uh, after the Second World War. I might be wrong. If I am, then uh, please let me know in the comments. Now let's look at this uh, self-lubricating barrel. How good is that self-lubrication? Turns out it's amazingly good. Look at this. This is fantastic. I didn't know anything could uh, self-lubricate quite that much. It's actually so much self-lubricated we need to really clean it. And yes, you do come across this uh, so-called self-lubricating barrels uh, every now and then. And they often say do not open. So obviously the first thing we do is to open them. We need to also peg the jewel holes. They are uh, not too badly congealed or anything, but uh, still good practice. And then we can fill up the entire basket. And off we go. And while the machine does the cleaning job for us, let's uh, have a look at the case. I'm going to take uh, the old gasket out of the case pack. And for the case itself, we're going to unscrew the pusher. Most pushers are like this, screwed into the pusher from the inside. And then we can uh, put all of that in uh, the ultrasonic. Get ready for the most beautiful, soothing sound in the whole wide world. Mm. So with the movement back from the cleaning machine, let's uh, first put in the, the mainspring. We're using this uh, mainspring winder, which uh, is a tool with a set of uh, barrel sizes. So we find the one that matches the best needs to fit inside the actual barrel. And with the mainspring inside that uh, barrel in the tool, we can press it down into the actual barrel. Now a small problem with this barrel is that uh, the barrel arbor has a very long end. What that means is that it's not easy to get uh, the barrel hook into the uh, eye of uh, the inner loop of the mainspring. So what we can do then is to uh, place the barrel arbor with the hook outside uh, the loop. And then we use a pin vise to uh, rotate it in place. All right, with the barrel ready, let's look at the shock settings. We can see here that uh, one of the stones is clearly thicker than the other. And when that is the case, then as a rule of thumb, the thicker one goes in the balance. If one of them is wider, than the other, then the wider one is also typically in the balance. So the thinking is that uh, the watch is more likely to rest against uh, that uh, endstone, 
given that the dial is probably up. So that's why they have a little bit extra protection there. Now, if the Inca block spring has come loose, as uh, ours did, there are two openings on uh, opposite sides of the block. So we can gently fit the T end of the spring in one end, and then the two prongs on the other side. And these springs are extremely pingable. So be very gentle. All right, that looks uh, nice. Then let's uh, start building the base movement. First thing we do is oil the barrel arbor on both sides. When we put the oil into that small opening there, the capillary action will uh, sort of suck the oil in. So that works nicely. We use uh, epilam or fixo drop on the escape wheel and also on the pallet stones. And then we're going to put the pivot ends into some uh, pithwood and that's to clean off any residue. As is common on these old uh, chronograph movements, uh, the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel are both uh, under the bridge. We're putting some D5 or uh, HP1300 on these different posts. Basically everywhere metal rubs against metal in a rotary fashion. Where there's more uh, pressure, so uh, like in Achilles works for instance, there we use uh, 9504 or 8200 or some sort of grease. Molecote DX, also popular. All right, looks like the train is free. And when you're working on watches, then the OCD is definitely your friend. Good to be a little bit obsessive about making sure you don't break any pivots. We're on the dial side. First thing I like to do is put uh, the cannon pinion back on. If you do that first, then you won't have the problem of the cannon pinion uh, possibly mangling some of the teeth in the minute wheel. And here also we use uh, D5 or HP 1300 on the posts. Another thing to uh, take note of for these old chronograph movements is that there are quite a few screws and um, a lot of these screws are shouldered. And when you see a shouldered screw, that basically means that something is rotating around the shoulder. As we saw there, for instance, uh, with the yoke. So that's a good way to uh, keep them apart if you need to. Checking that everything works, making sure we oil everything, or lubricate rather. And then we can turn the movement over again and get the pallet fork in. And we're going to also lubricate the pallet fork. Now one watchmaker I know, he does uh, the oiling of the pallet stones uh, by eye. And mind you, this is like a 0.2 millimeter surface or something. So uh, good luck if I were to do that. Okay, 
we got the balance back in we're gonna oil the different pivots we use uh, d5 or hp 1300 on uh, the wheels closest to the center wheel and then 9 to 10 for the rest okay with a good wind we're gonna demagnetize the watch and then uh, see how it runs now might remember that it ran pretty okay before not very good amplitude and too fast but uh, the lines were relatively straight and we see the watch uh, runs very well it's really good but uh, let's uh, go a little bit further and look at the positional errors if the watch is uh, timed at nine o'clock up or six o'clock up we see that it runs much too fast and the main reason for this is typically that the hairspring is not positioned properly inside the index pins it's not so easy to uh, really film this but if we zoom in we can see that the hairspring is resting against that uh, inner index pin and also you can see that there's much too much space between the index pin and the boot on the left side so what we do to rectify that is to simply press on uh, the hairspring on the opposite side and we can reduce the space for the hairspring by simply uh, pressing the index pin a little bit closer to the boot So after making these changes, this is dial up. That little shaking in the camera is that we changed the position. And then we need to uh, let it find its balance. After about 30 seconds, it will be stabilizing. And we see it's uh, more or less flat line. This is nine o'clock up. And now we're going to uh, six o'clock up. And then it looks much more stable. Now this is an unadjusted watch, which means that it's never really made to run at exactly the same rate in all kinds of positions. But we always want to check a dial up, a 9 up and 6 up. Because those are the three most common positions that a wristwatch is uh, held in. Alright, with the base movement running nicely, we can start with the chronograph. First put in the chronograph driving wheel. And for this particular uh, movement, we're going to start with a pillar wheel. I mentioned earlier that there's a different uh, cadence for uh, how the pillar wheel operates. So with the mono pusher, it's a one, two, three. And it's only at the third step that the hammer can be released or actually it's always released whereas with a two pusher uh, column wheel chronograph it's always one two one two one two and that start stop start stop start stop start stop 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 and in a two pusher column wheel chronograph the reset can also only happen after the watch has been stopped now the way all this is managed is that at the end of this uh, clutch you can see there's uh, like a little beak going towards the pillar wheel on the other end here is what looks like a screw but it's actually for adjusting the depth thing between the driving wheel and the clutch wheel so that's an eccentric by uh, rotating that a little bit you can uh, make the depth thing um, bigger or smaller I'm going to point out the different eccentrics as we go along as well. And we're already at the next one. This eccentric adjusts the depth thing between a clutch wheel and a chronograph wheel in the center. And uh, as mentioned in the Mirex solve video, if the depth thing is uh, fine, then don't touch the eccentrics. Because you'll often find yourself uh, adjusting all of them. If you start adjusting one and that can be a quite a hassle we put in the intermediate minute uh, counter wheel and i almost forgot this eccentric which adjusts the depth thing between the intermediate uh, minute counting wheel and the finger on the chronograph wheel very important to have this one right
and then we can put in uh, the friction spring for the chronograph wheel. And the minute counter wheel. The brake that we're putting in here is to basically uh, stop the chronograph wheel so it doesn't uh, rotate by itself if uh, we stop the chronograph. And the hammer which we put in here is to then reset the two uh, counting wheels, the chronograph wheel and the minute wheel to zero. And it does that by hitting those heart shaped cams on top of the chronograph uh, counting wheels. And then when we press the chronograph uh, pusher, you will see uh, all those different beaks going in and out of the spaces between the pillars in uh, the column wheel. Just very fascinating, these uh, old uh, chronograph uh, movements, the horizontal clutch ones. That is the classic uh, chronograph layout and also the most uh, beautiful or fascinating one. And here is the last eccentric. This is for the minute counter jumper. And let's see the minute wheel jump. And we saw this little extra movement there from the finger on the chronograph wheel, which means that we have to uh, pull the intermediate uh, minute counter wheel a little bit away. So that's an example of uh, the eccentric adjustment. All right, let's catch up with the case. We got it back from the ultrasonic and we need to put in uh, the pusher again. Put a little bit of oil on it. And then it should uh, work smoothly. We're also going to change the crystal. It's a standard crystal, so we don't have to uh, try to polish it. It's uh, 30.7 wide, so we take uh, sides a little bit bigger. And then we find uh, the right dice in our crystal press. And we kind of want to smash, right? But no, just press. Oh well. Last thing to do then, before we can put the watch on the wrist, is to put on the hour wheel and the dial and the hands. So here is the key difference between uh, the Longines 334, if you will, and the Valjou 236. The Valjou 236 has a small seconds uh, hand. And that would be on the opposite side, of course, of the minute counter there at uh, nine o'clock. But it's cool. Gives the dial a little bit extra character, I suppose. There's no uh, date on this uh, movement. So uh, we don't have to worry about uh, setting the hands at uh, midnight. But it's kind of old habit we do it anyway. And we want to make sure the hand resets properly. Yeah, that looks fine. And then the same for the minute counter. Let's start it and then we can let it run for 10 minutes. But uh, let's not wait 10 minutes, so we'll uh, speed it up a bit. 60 times speed. So now we have the second counter on the minute side. All right. Let's see if um, both hands reset as they should. Yeah. All right, and then we can uh, case the movement. And we're pretty much done. Just need to uh, replace the gasket in uh, the case back. Put the stem in place and the case screws. For these screws like this, I'm always a little bit nervous, don't want to put any screws into the balance. 
So it can be a good uh, idea to let down uh, the mainspring. And with that uh, lovely case back on, we're ready to wear the watch. Well, we kind of need a strap, I suppose, but uh, let's not get bogged down in the details. And there we have it. A very cool watch. That asymmetric dial is really uh, something special. Case is in very good condition, and it would be very difficult to do anything about it anyway, given uh, the finishing it has. I hope you liked this video. If you did, then uh, share it on Facebook and wherever you can. Leave your comment and a like and subscribe. We'll be back with another video shortly. Until then, ta-ta.